Given the fertile ground Ricardo's political economy presented for socialist conclusions, it was naturally seen as problematic by apologists for the newly arisen system of industrial capitalism. Marx made a fundamental distinction in this regard between the classical political economists and the vulgar economists who came after them. Smith, James Mill, and Ricardo had developed their scientific political economy without fear of its revolutionary implications. Because industrial capital was still the progressive underdog in the revolutionary struggle against the unearned income of the feudal landlords and chartered monopolists. But that situation came to an end with the capitalist acquisition of political power. In France and England, the bagacious had conquered power. In the decisive crisis year of 1830, thenceforth, the class struggle, practically as well as theoretically, took on more and more outspoken and threatening forms. It sounded the knoll of scientific bagacious economy. It was, thenceforth, no longer a question whether this theorem or that was true, but whether it was useful to the capital or harmful, expedient or inexpedient, political, dangerous or not. In place of disinterested inquirers, there were hired prize fighters. In place of genuine scientific research, the bad conscious and evil intent of the apologetic. Maurits Daub likewise commented on the transition of political economy from a revolutionary to an apologetic role. As a critique leveled simultaneously against the authoritarianism of an autocratic state and against the privileges and influence of the landed aristocracy, political economy at its inception played a revolutionary role. Only later, in its post-Ricardian phase, did it pass over from an assault on privilege and restriction to apology for property. Although the brick was perhaps not as fundamental as Marxists have made it out to be, there is evidence that at least some of the political economists from the 1830s on, as well as the founders of marginalism, were conscious of the political aspects of the problem. According to Maurice Dobb, the vulgar political economists were consciously motivated by apologetic consideration. As an alternative to the mainstream classical school of England, they turned to the subjectivist continual school, which had been influenced by, say, interpretation of Adam Smith. It was against the whole Ricardian mode of approach that senior Longfield school reacted so strongly, not merely as an apostate analytical tool, but against its wider applications and corollaries. In reacting in this way, it was almost inevitable that they should be carried in the wake of, and eventually join, the other and rival tradition deriving from Smith reinforcing it by so doing. If they are properly described at all as improvers or conciliators, conciliators, such a term should really be applied to their role in developing this Smithian tradition and not the Ricardian approach. Among the first generation of marginalists, Yevons at least was quite conscious of the political dimensions of his anti-Ricardian project. To quote Dobbs again, although Menger could be said to have represented this break with classical tradition even more clearly and completely, Yevons was apparently more conscious of the role he was playing in reshunting the car of economic science, which Ricardo had so perversely directed onto a wrong line. Dodd considered it telling that the marginalist refinement of subjectivism had been produced near simultaneously by three different writers. Within a decade of the publication of Capital, it indicated a prevailing atmosphere of ideological combat and a vacancy for anti-Marxian polemicists waiting to be filled. It is at least a remarkable fact that within ten years of appearance of the first volume of Capital, not only had the rival utility principle by enunciated 
independently by a number of writers, but the new principle was finding a receptive receptivity to its acceptance, such as few ideas of similar novelty can ever have met. If only by effect of negation, the influence of Marx on economic theory of the 19th century would appear to have been much more profound than it is fashionable to admit. That so many of the economists of the last quarter of the century should have ad- advertised their war- wares as such an epoch-making novelty, entitled their lances so menacingly at their forebearers, seemed to have an obvious, if unflattering, explanation, namely, the dangerous use to which Ricardian, Ricardian notions had been recently put by Marx. And of the second generation of Austrians, Bohm Barwerk seemed quite aware, in Dobbs' opinion of the ideological nature of tasks before him, it seems clear that Bohm Barwerk, at any rate, appreciated the problem which the classical theory had sought to solve. While he is sparing almost niggardly in paying tribute to Marx even for formulating the question accurately, there is every indication that he framed his theory directly to provide a substitute answer to the question which Marx had posed. If such speculations on political motives of the marginalists' revolutionary seem unflattering, unfair, or ad hominem, it is worth bearing in mind that Bohm Barwerk himself was not above pointing to ideological motivations of his predecessors. In language very reminiscent of Marx's dismissal of the vulgar economists, even more than grinding his axe against Marx, Bohm Barwerk seemed to have been motivated by a desire to demonstrate the originality of his own views at the expense of previous defenses of interests like that of Nassau Sr. Sr.'s absentee theory has obtained great popularity among those economists who are favorably disposed to interest. It seems to me, however, that this popularity has been due not so much to its superiority as a theory as that it came in the nick of time to support interest against the severe attacks that had been made on it. I draw this inference from the peculiar circumstance that the vast majority of its later advocates do not profess its exclusively but only add elements of abstinence, abstinence theory in an aesthetic way to other theories favorable to interest. Since Bohm Barwerk was not above such a critique of his own predecessor, we have no obligation to spare him similar treatment for an excess of chivalry. It is remarkable, at least, how the cultural atmosphere of classical liberal mainstream changed from the early 19th century on, from a revolutionary assault on the entrenched power of the landed aristocracy and charter monopolies by the late 19th century, it had become an apology for the institutions and interests most closely resembling, in power and privilege, the ruling class of the old regime. The large corporations and pluto- the plutocracy, the shift toward reaction was by no means uniform, however. The revolutionary and anti-privileged character of early movement continued in many strands of liberalism. Thomas Hodgkin, squarely in the classical liberal tradition and also by the far most market-oriented of the Ricardian socialists, criticized the power of industrial capitalists in language reminiscent of Adam Smith's attack on landlords and mercantilists, and on very much the same principles. The American school of individualist anarchism likewise turned the weapons of free market analysis against the status prop props of capitalist privilege. Even Hodgkin disciple Spencer, usually regarded as a stereotypical apologist for capitalism, at times displayed such tendencies. Henry George and his follower Albert Nook Nock, likewise turned classical liberalism towards radically populist ends. Our own version of free market socialism set out in this book comes from these heirs of the armed doctrine of classical liberalism. 
At any rate, regardless of their political motivations, the marginalists performed a necessary role. Their detailed critique of classical political economy pointed out many areas in need of clarification, or of a more explicit philosophical basis, and the marginalist critique, especially that of Bohm Barak, produced genuinely valuable innovations which any viable labor theory of value must incorporate. One such criticism, Bohm Barak's critique of labor theory, for its lack of an adequate mechanism, and one of innovation, the Austrian time preference theory, will be integrated in the following chapters into a reworked labor theory of value.